Is it true that Kalashnikov is a copy of the STG-44? Why did Hitler hate these weapons so much and how was STG-44 able to hit the whole world, surpassing all samples of similar weapons of that time? Interested? Then watch the video till the end and be sure to hit the like button. Once upon a time in the early 1918s, Captain Pitteret, a member of the Committee for Studying Small Arms in the German General Staff in Berlin, came up with a brilliant idea. He proposed introducing an in-between bullet paired with a suitable firearm. His reasoning was quite amusing. Apparently, most firefights rarely happened beyond 800 meters, which is roughly half of the maximum range of the Mauser 98 rifle, firing the 7.92 by 57 cartridge and even less than the maximum range of the MG08 machine gun. So, to save on resources and allow soldiers to carry more ammo, Pitterit suggested a smaller, shorter and less powerful bullet. Imagine soldiers being able to carry a ton of ammo and unleashing a mighty barrage of firepower. And guess what? With reduced recoil, they could even create semi-automatic or fully automatic rifles with selective fire. How cool is that? Pitterit even called it the Machina Pistole, machine pistol in this article. Sounds like something straight out of an action movie. At first, the German army wasn't too keen on the idea. They already had the MP18, a submachine gun firing 9mm pistol rounds, and didn't want to invest resources in developing a new cartridge and weapon for it. But hey, time changes everything, right? By 1923, they had a change of heart and demanded a replacement for the Gewehr 98 rifle. Their wish list for the new firearm was quite hilarious. It had to be smaller and lighter than the Mauser, have similar accuracy up to 400 meters, and come up with a magazine capacity of 20 or 30 rounds. Challenge accepted. They sent the ammunition task to the folks at Polte in Magdeburg, while HWA, the military agency, made a deal with CG Hanno of Seoul to craft the weapon. HWA's requirements were pretty straightforward too. The rifle had to be shorter, have the same or lighter weight than the Car 98K, retain accuracy up to 400 meters, and boast a firing rate of up to 450 rounds per minute. Oh, and let's not forget, it had to be reliable, work well with a grenade launcher and sport a user-friendly design. They really wanted it all, didn't they? By 1941, various experimental cartridges had been developed, but the army decided to go for yet another new creation, the Polter 8x33mm Kurzbetrone, also known as the short cartridge. It featured a Spitzer bullet and the basic design of a standard 7.92x57mm rifle cartridge, but trimmed down to 7.92x33mm Kurtz. Admittedly, it wasn't a perfect result, but hey, it would have at least minimized logistical problems. Contracts for rifles firing the 7.92x33mm Kurtz rounds were awarded to both Walther and Hanel, led by the ingenious Hugo Schmeiser. They were asked to present a prototype of the weapon called the Machina Carabiner 1942, a carbine machine gun or MKB-42. As things progressed, the MKB-42H, together with the less successful MKB-42W, became precursors to the later MP-43, MP-44 and STG-44. In fact, most of the characteristics of the MP43 were borrowed from the MKB42H with its ingenious firing system and a bolt system originating from the MKB42W. However, as the development of this new firing system advanced, progress halted when Hitler suspended all programs for creating new rifles due to administrative struggles within the Third Reich. To preserve the MKB-42H development program, the arms department decided to rename the weapon as the Machina Pistole 43 or MP43 and, after making several improvements, declared it an upgrade to the existing submachine guns. Way to overcome the bureaucratic challenges and keep the innovation going! Here's the wild tale of the MP43 and its crazy journey through history. So, Adolf Hitler caught wind of the deception and he slammed the brakes on the program yet again. But you know what they say about second chances. In March 1943, he decided to give it another shot for some evaluation time. The suspense lasted for six whole months until September 1943. And guess what? Positive results! Hitler was so stoked that he yelled, Alright, let's keep this party going! 
and gave the thumbs up for the MP43 program to kick into mass production mode. Woohoo! Now, let's talk about this fancy weapon. Picture this. It boasted some snazzy modern features like cost-effective stamped components, which was like the bee's knees of innovation back in the 1940s. No more old-fashioned machine parts, folks. This was the future. When the first batch of MP43 rifles rolled out, they were delivered straight to the Waffen SS like a boss. And not long after, in October 1943, some lucky peeps from the 93rd Infantry Division on the Eastern Front got their hands on these cool babies. Production was on a roll and these rifles were spreading like wildfire among various units. But wait, they had high hopes for making the MP43 the star of the show, the replacement for the Carabiner 98K rifle. However, it turned out to be a bit of a comedy of errors. The MP43 cartridge just couldn't handle the pressure. It was too wimpy for rifle grenades and too much of a scatterbrain for sniper shots. And hey, the gun itself was just too short for some serious bayonet action. Bummer. So they had to settle for plan B. In September 1943, they declared that the MP43 would be more like the Car 98K's trusty sidekick complementing it rather than taking over the spotlight. They had to make some adjustments though, say goodbye to the optical sight mount, extended grenade launcher barrel threads, and the bayonet lug. Off they went. But the saga continues. In April 1944, Hitler had a sudden change of heart and got curious again about weapon trials. He shouted, let's give this baby a makeover, and decided to rename it to MP44 with a few little updates for flair. Fast forward to July 1944, he's hanging out with the army commanders on the Eastern Front and asked, what's the scoop, generals? One of the generals couldn't contain his excitement and cried out, we need more of these rifles. Talk about a surprise party. Hitler was all like, wait, what new rifle are you talking about? But then, ta-da! When he saw the MP44 in action, he was totally blown away and thought, this is it. It needs a catchy name. So he christened it Stormgewehr. And to add some pizzazz to the whole thing, they changed the name yet again to Stormgewehr 44, giving it a serious dose of wow factor. And that's how the term assault rifle entered the history books. What a roller coaster ride, right? Let's dive into the wild world of the MP43, MP44, and STG44. They're like the three musketeers, but in rifle form. Picture this. They might have had a little makeover here and there during production, but at heart, they're all the same rifle, just with different outfits. It's like giving your favorite car a fresh coat of paint and some cool new rims. Still the same beast under the hood. Now let's get to the juicy stuff. These bad boys were on a mission to take down those sneaky Soviet submachine guns like the PPSH-41 and PPS. Those cheeky submachine guns were all about those zippy 7.62 by 25mm Tokarev cartridges, packing quite a punch with their 71 round drum mags or 35 round box mags. But guess what? The STG-44 was no slouch in close combat. It might have been a tad shorter than the Car 98K rifle, but it could dance circles around those submachine guns in up-close and personal battles. Oh, and hold on to your hats, because the STG-44 brought some serious firepower to the party. Even though it couldn't match the Car 98K's range, it outshot those PPSH machine guns and had more power to boot. It was like having a Swiss Army knife of rifles, versatile, adaptable, and ready to rock and roll. You could even switch between fully automatic and semi-automatic fire on the fly. And boy, was it precise for its size. Talk about a compact powerhouse, folks. Let's break it down a bit further. The STG-44 was the cool kid on the block back in its day. With its long barrel, its bullet zoomed at 685 meters per second or over 2,000 feet per second. Not as fast as the Car 98K, but still faster than the British Bren and the M1 carbine. And thanks to its sleek linear design, it was like wielding a lightsaber on the battlefield. Handling it in full auto mode was a breeze. It was practically dancing in the hands of the soldiers. In a nutshell, the STG-44 gave individual soldiers an unprecedented amount of firepower compared to the old-school firearms. It was like upgrading from an old clunky phone to the latest, shiniest smartphone. No wonder other countries were like, we need some of that action too, and jumped on the assault rifle bandwagon. 
the STG-44 wasn't just another rifle. Oh no, it was the trailblazer, the trendsetter. The very first successful assault rifle paving the way for others to follow. It had those game-changing features like the intermediate cartridge and controllable automatic fire. Imagine it like the first iPhone. It changed the game, baby! Back in the day, other rifles were all about sniping targets from far away. But guess what? Most battles happened within a few hundred meters, so the STG-44 was tailor-made for those up-close and personal encounters. Of course, with fame comes some playful teasing. The Brits couldn't resist the little fun saying, your stock can bend and your bolt can get stuck. Oh, the drama. But hey, nobody's perfect, right? And the US folks were like, yeah, it's alright, but kind of bulky and not as sleek as we'd like. But hey, even they had to admit its accuracy was top-notch for its kind. It's like being a rock star. Some haters, some fans, but you keep on rocking. Other countries soon fell head over heels for this assault rifle concept and made their own versions. It was like a real-life trendsetter and history won't forget its flashy performance. Can you believe that the magazine follower spring in the STG-44 had a bit of a temper? Yep, it had a short service life, so those clever soldiers were given strict orders. Load no more than 25 rounds. Better to treat it with kids' gloves, you know, to keep that springy magic going strong. But wait, there's more! In January 1945, they rolled out a nifty magazine with a fixed block capping its capacity at 25 rounds. Talk about keeping things snappy and sassy. Now picture this, the STG-44 was a full auto hotshot, but those German soldiers weren't about to go trigger happy like there's no tomorrow. Oh no, they were given the semi-automatic mode memo. Full auto was like a secret weapon, saved for dire situations only, unleashing two or three shot bursts, just enough to make their foes shake in their boots. Fast forward to the end of the war, and guess what? A grand total of 425,000 STG-44 variations had hit the scene. That's right, it was the star of the show, no doubt, and the party didn't stop there. They even began plotting the next big thing, the STG-45. Talk about keeping the momentum going. Let's take a trip to the Eastern Front, where the STG-44 made its grand entrance. This baby was a game changer. Those well-trained soldiers with their STG-44s had all the right moves. They could hit targets way out yonder, leaving the MP40 in the dust. And when it came to close quarters showdowns, it outshone the Car 98 k hands down. Plus, this dynamo played dress up as a light machine gun, dishing out suppressive fire like a boss. No wonder it was a rock star on the battlefield. Oh, but that's not all my friends. The STG-44 had some serious swag with its signature curved barrel, also known as the Krumler. Picture this, shooting around corners, taking cover like a pro. Yeah, it was a daring accessory back in World War II. You know what's crazier. But wait, there's a secret source to this magical STG-44 mix. The curved barrel was like peanut butter to its jelly. It was tailor-made to handle the STG-44's zesty flavor, because it was one of the first to rock an intermediate cartridge. Smart move, folks. Going bigger would have strained its barrel under pressure, and going smaller? Well, it would have been like bringing a pea shooter to a gunfight. So, in short, the STG-44 was a trendsetter with some seriously legendary accessories that might not have been everywhere, but they were still turning heads in a few corners of the world today. Hey, did you hear the buzz on the internet? People are chattering about a juicy rumor they say our legendary AK-47 might have had a secret crush on the STG-44. <gasps> Time to uncover the truth, folks! Now let's be real, the extent to which the Sturmgewehr influenced the AK-47 is like solving a mystery. Sure, there are some sizzling similarities in how they look and operate with that gas-operated action. But hold your horses! The AK-47 wasn't just a copycat, my friends. Oh no, it had its own magic source, its own mechanical marvel under the hood. But here's where it gets intriguing. When the Soviet Union snagged thousands of STGs, who knows what happened next? Those beauties might have had a fling with Kalashnikov and his crew. You never know. Imagine the love letters of engineering secrets exchanged in the dark corners of history. Now, 
The 7.62 by 39 mm cartridge in the AK-47? Guess what? It got its flirt on the 7.92 by 33 mm cartridge from the STG-44. Oh, the sparks were flying, my friend. But hey, it's all fair in love and war, right? Guess what? The STG-44 kept the party going in East Germany's National Volksarmee, strutting its stuff as the MPI-44. But all good things must come to an end, and it eventually had to step aside for the domestic star, the AK-47. In the grand finale, yes, there might have been a little STG-44 influence, but the AK-47 had its own swagger, its own flavor, and boy did it make a name for itself. It became a rock star, an icon, and everyone wanted a piece of that action. So there you have it, a tale of inspiration, a dash of mystery, and the birth of a true legend. The AK-47 carved its path, and it's still rocking the world like no other. Cheers to the gun that stole our hearts and revolutionized the battlefield.